Ashiwaju Bola Metinubu, the Jagaban Bogu, and the Jagaban of the universe. And his dear wife, herself a notable political phenomenon, ranking Senator Oluremi Tinubu. the national chairman of the APC, comrade Adam Soshiomole, and former chairman of the APC, Baba Pisi Akonde, Baba Omar KKK, all other leaders of the APC here present, your excellencies, governors of various states present, led by Governor Akil Miambode, our chief host, His Excellency Abdulaziz Yari of Zamfara State, His Excellency Mohammed Abubakar of Bauchi State, His Excellency Abiola Ajimobi, Ajimobi of Oyo State, His Excellency Adeboyega Oyetola of Oshun State, His Excellency Kayode Fayemi of Ekiti State, His Excellency Oluwarotimi Akeredolu of Ondo State, His Excellency, His Excellency Governor Lalong of Plateau State, former Governor of Oshun State, Ogbeni Rauf Aregbesola, the Governor-elect of Lagos State, Governor-elect of Lagos State, Mr. Babajide Sonwolu, I'm sorry, Deputy Governor of Edo State, uh, Comrade Philip Schwaibo. Members of the National Assembly present, members of the Federal Executive Council present, service chiefs and I believe the Inspector General of Police in particular is here, Your Excellencies of the Diplomatic Corps, our Royal Fathers present, uh, Imperial Majesty the Oni of Ife, Oba of Muzi of Jaja II, His Royal Majesty the Owa of Bukun, who is also present today, his Royal Majesty, the Ewe of, of Adoikiti, of Arufos Adejube. His Royal Majesty, the Oshemawe of Ondo, Dr. Victor Kila Dejo. His Royal Highness, Kitaro II of Bogu Kingdom, Barista Mohammed Dantoro. His Royal Highness, the Honor of Abaji, Dr. Adamu Baba Yunusa. And all um, the representative, the representative of my own uh, Kabiesi, the representative of the Karibu of Remoland, the Alado of Ado, His Royal Highness Oba Amisu, Sholak Badeti Jani, and all other royal fathers who are present here today. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are here for the 11th edition of the Bola Tinubu Colloquium. This is a yearly development gathering, a yearly gathering where we try to question and interrogate some of the difficult questions on economic and social development, not just in Nigeria, but across the world. We do it in celebration of a man who has spent the last 30 years of his life in creative and catalytic public service. He has, from his days as governor of Lagos State, provided clarity of thought and vision, pioneering vision in all aspects of governance. He is not a lawyer, as many of us know, but there are few Nigerians who have provoked so many legal controversies and constitutional challenges resulting in several landmark judicial rulings 
especially in the area of federalism and what today is loosely described as restructuring. Many of us know, of course, that he's not an engineer, but a lot of his vision is what is responsible for what we see today in Lagos. The BRT, many know uh, the bus rapid transport, uh, uh, transport, the Lekki Industrial Zone, even the Eco Atlantic Project, which is a private project, but which he initiated as governor of Lagos State. And of course, the reform in the, the reform in the tax system of Lagos State. Today, Lagos, as we know, earns more revenue, more IGR, than 31 states of, of, of Nigeria put together. That by itself began in 2001 with a very innovative way in which he reformed the tax system in Lagos and created an independent Lagos Inland Revenue Service. Several, several African countries and states of Nigeria have engaged the LIRS as consultants for their own reform efforts. But how about electoral reform? In 2007, when our party, then the ACM, was rigged out of elections in Oshun, in Ekiti, in Ondo, and in Edo State, I was asked, he invited me to his residence, as Ashwa, he invited me to his residence at Bodilong. And he said to me, the only way by which we can possibly reclaim the states that have been taken away from us by this region is going through the courts. And he said to me that the only way is by proving that there was multiple voting. In other words, proving that a few people simply thumbprinted ballot papers dumped the ballot papers into, uh, into ballot boxes, and they were counted in favor of the opposition. Then, of course, the PDP. He then said to me that the only way we can do this is by somehow, he says, I don't know how you are going to do it, but somehow proving by forensic evidence that this is exactly what happened. I said to him, I said, Ashwaju, look, nobody has ever proved an electoral, uh, an electoral case, an electoral petition by forensic evidence. There's just no history of it. He said, and I said, what is even more? We have over a million, a million ballot papers. If we, if we consider all of the ballot papers in each of these states, there are over a million. In fact, at the time, there were about 1.3 million ballot papers putting together all the states. And how can we prove multiple voting. He said, you know, you mean, no, you, I, I've told you what my own view is. You just go and look for a way of sorting this out. So I went to the UK and met with possibly the most experienced uh, fingerprint expert in the, in the entire United Kingdom, a gentleman called Adrian Fawlty, introduced to me by uh, some of the uh, QCs who I'd worked with in the, U, in the UK. And when I told Adrian Forty the enormity of the problem, he laughed and almost fell off his chair. He said, in all my own almost 50 years of experience as a fingerprint expert, I have not even done up to 4,000 fingerprints. You are now saying that I should come and do 1.3 million fingerprints. That's, come on, I mean, that's, that's almost impossible. Anyway, so we parted that day, that was the Thursday. And then he called me back on a Monday and said, let's talk again about this crazy thing that you are suggesting. And we sat and talked about it. And somehow designed a way, he said, of course, we used a bit of technology. But most importantly, we, got, we were able to get fingerprint experts. He said to me, he said, the only way is to get the number of fingerprint experts that have never been assembled before. I said, about how many? He said a minimum of 50 fingerprint experts. In the end, we hired 63 fingerprint experts, 63. 50 of them were from the UK police. That was, what was even more interesting about that was that even to get the UK police to support us, 
Ashwajua to come all the way from Nigeria to come and talk to friends and people who he knew to try and persuade the authorities to let us use the UK police. In the end, they allowed us to, of course, in the spare time of those policemen. And we got an additional 10 yeah, policemen, altogether 63 policemen, working flat out for almost six months. We were able to put together for the first time, definitely in the history of electoral petitions anywhere in the world, we were able to put together a solid forensic case that showed that all of the places where we were defeated, it was on account of multiple thumbprinting. And we also demonstrated that it was impossible for those who said they voted. For instance, we showed that if you, if you cast 20,000 votes in a particular unit, when we calculated the time that it takes to cast one single vote, it's usually above five minutes. But we discovered that our friends in that other political party were able to cast their votes in five seconds because all they were doing was simply thumbprinting. Uh, they just simply take out a booklet and thumbprint as many as possible. So we were able to demonstrate all of that in court. Cut a long story short, one by one, we were able to get back the states that had been taken away from us. The only way by which that could ever have been achieved is surely not just by the vision, but by the determination of the leader of, the, of our leader at that time. He was, of course, uh, the leader of the ACN at the time. And he showed the kind of leadership that was very, very rare, of course. Not only defining what he thought was the way forward, but also supporting it in every way and backing it to the very end. The last uh, state that we finally won was Osho State. After almost three years of battling, we finally won Osho State. And I think that, you know, uh, one of the things that you will say that all of us will agree with about uh, our celebrant today is just that his dogged attitude, his refusal to accept no for an answer. Ashwa, you also pioneered merit in cabinet appointments in particular. And I want to emphasize this because one of the major drawbacks that we have as a nation is that way by which we are, we are blindsided into thinking that we can avoid merit and expect to achieve great things. We simply cannot avoid merit. I think I should you demonstrated in the years when he was governor that political appointments, especially cabinet appointments, he simply looked for those that he considered the best possible material at the time, wherever they were from. So for the first time in the history of Lagos State, we had cabinet members from other parts of the country, beginning with other parts of the Southwest. Rauf Arekbeshwala, of course, is from Oshun State. I, from Ogun State. Wali Edun from Ogun State. Arthur Wari from Delta. He became the first commissioner for lands. Lai Mohammed from Kwara State. Delia Laki from, uh, uh, from Ekiti State, you know, and so many others. For the first time, we appointed judges from other, in fact, I've, I've forgotten Ben Akabuizi. Ben Akabuizi, of course, from Anambra State was uh, Commissioner for uh, Economic Planning and Budget uh, after Yemi Kaduso. And for several years after that, he served as uh, Commissioner for Budget and National Planning. But also judges, the appointment of judges from e everywhere else in the country. Justice Zoyabo and Justice Sibyl Nwaka were both appointed to be judges of Lagos State. There is no other state in the country except some states in the north where we've seen the appointment of individuals from other states. And I should you pioneered that. Just picking the best people, no matter where they're from, is a very important part of our story as a country. So every once in a while, I think that history gives us one or two persons who are gifted, transformative leaders. And I believe that 
our country has been gifted by this great transformative leader, Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu. I believe very strongly, I believe very strongly that uh, this man's political trajectory has only just begun. He's a man who has tremendous giftings, and is a man who I believe God has a great plan ahead for. I pray for you, Ashiwaju, that as your days, so shall your strength, so shall your wisdom, and so shall your favor with God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I'll just say a word or two about the next level. As you know, this, the expression next level itself was our political our campaign slogan in these last elections. And what we were saying uh, was simply that there was a next phase to what our country had seen. There are many who would say that there were several things that were promised in uh, 2015 which had not yet been realized. But one of the, one of, I think the, most, uh, the best way of putting it is to simply say that our country for the first time is experiencing a type of leadership that is bound to lead us to where it is that we, are, we have purpose for ourselves as a government. The honest, in my view, the honest leadership, a leadership with integrity, of our president, President Muhammad Buhari, is a very important component of getting anywhere at all in all of our development plans. I've said before at the last colloquium that Nigeria's main problem is not a lack of ideas, is not a lack of projects or programs. It was most of the time, especially with the leadership in the past, was a lack of integrity in leadership and corruption in particular was the reason why we were finding it difficult to make any progress. And I explained that that's why we earned 383 billion US dollars in four years, 2010 to 2014, the highest ever in the history of our country, the highest ever. And yet, Lagos Ibadan Expressway, not done. Lagos Kano Rail, all of what is being done today, not done. We cannot point to a single major project a single major infrastructure project that was completed in that in a 10-year period, despite the high earnings, including power. So we so so a, a, a government coming after so many years of waste must be a government first that emphasizes fiscal prudence, a government that emphasizes integrity in public finance so that we manage the little resources we have to achieve the maximum that can be achieved. And that is what President Muhammad Buhari set out to do. As I keep saying, the president has never, has never claimed to be an orator. And we all know that he's not an orator. He just gets things done. It was under President Muhammad Buhari that three of the four refineries that we have today were built when he was Minister for Petroleum. 3,500 kilometers of pipelines were built by him as Minister of Petroleum in a three-year period. So there's a track record here, not of talking, but of just getting things done. And this is what we've seen in the past four years. That is why we're able to put aside the money for the Lagos Ibadan Expressway, and that is going on at pace at the moment. That is why we've opened the first phase of the Lagos Kano Railway. And that was commissioned just a few weeks before, a, a couple of days, uh, I think it was just last month, that that was commissioned, the Lagos uh, Abekutai Badon phase of that project. The Takwewari Railway, now completed, after 35 years of being on the books, the, the Lagos the, 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 the Abuja Rail, the light rail project here in Abuja, started in 2005, budget after budget, never completed, was completed also at the end of 2017. Now we have that light rail, now we have that light rail from the airport to, to Idu. And same as several other projects, several other major infrastructural projects, 
Mambila Hydro has been on the cards for 40 years. We've just put together the resources to, to begin that project. And we will complete this project. So for us, infrastructure is critical at the next level. You cannot have power, you cannot have a situation where you have a, where you have the kind of power situation you have today and expect transformative development. That is why we're focused on power and other infrastructure. We are focused on fixing the infrastructure in our country. And we believe that if we're able to fix the infrastructure, the roads, the rail, and especially power, we'll be able to make significant progress. Today, our rail project starts from the Apapa port so that we're able to clear the congestion in that port because the rail, the Lagos Canal Rail, begins from the Apapa port and we can start taking out cargo from the Apapa port using rail as an alternative means of transportation. The same is true of agriculture, and you just heard our partners from Brazil talking about the, uh, the, the agro-industrial phase of agricultural development. And we're committed to that project because we believe that that is what will transform uh, the, the agro-industrial phase of, that, of, of our planning. And that's what will transform agriculture in, in this country and create the additional jobs that we require. It's not enough to have farmers everywhere. We need the refining capacity, we need the processing capacity. And that is what uh, our partnership with the Brazilians uh, will provide for us. Same is true of the reforms that we're making in education and healthcare. Today, the emphasis is, is on, di on, on digital literacy. The emphasis is on training our teachers to be able to train the next generation of, of, of children in school. And we're focused on doing so using some of the uh, using some of the methods that we've described very comprehensively not just in the ERGP but in our next level document which i hope will be made available today so we're focusing on science technology engineering arts and maths not stem but steam because we've added arts to it we're focusing on training young people in in uh, on, on training young people in uh, digital skills critical thinking, and various other skills that are necessary for the sorts of jobs that the 21st century will provide. The same is true of healthcare. Our focus on healthcare will be on national health insurance because we, can't, we cannot finance healthcare by the budget alone. It's nas compulsory national health insurance that's going to open the doors for financing healthcare, or well, financial healthcare for us. Finally, we're also talking again about social investment, our social investment program. At the next level, we're of course going to expand the social investment program. At the moment, the program is the biggest of its kind anywhere in, in, in the African continent, where we are feeding every day in our school feeding program 9.2 million children across 26 states every single day. That program is important, not just from the point of view of providing nutrition, for many of the young people in public schools, many of whom come from very poor parents, and many who may not be assured of a, of a decent meal a day. That is a very important program for us, also because of the multiply effect on agriculture and also on distribution of those products, and of course those we employ as cooks and, and other services. The same is true of our trader money program, the government enterprise and empowerment program, G, trader money, market money, and all of that, where we're giving money to the bottom of the trading pyramid in Nigeria. We lend them 10, uh, it's a program, of course, as you know, of the Bank of Industry. We lend 10,000 Naira to this bottom of the pyramid traders. Once they repay, we give them 15,000 Naira. All of this is done on an electronic platform, and it's on their mobile phones and they get 15,000 naira when they pay back 20, 25, all the way up to 100. The same is true of our market money, which we give to cooperatives. And we've done, so far, trader money almost over a million, and market money, which is to the cooperatives, almost 500,000. And we intend to expand the scope of that. We also intend to expand the scope of our NPOWER program, which is our jobs program for young people young graduates coming out of school and some non-graduates. At the moment, we're engaging 500,000 of such young people and paying them every month 
most of them now have a device such as I have, which contains training materials for enhancing their employability skills. And that uh, also, that device also helps us to track several things that we want to track, and also helps them to provide services, especially survey services, marketing, research and marketing services, to people who may engage uh, their services. We intend to expand that program because we must expand the program. 1.7 million people come out of school and are looking for jobs every single year. We're able to bridge that gap with engaging 500,000 of them as soon as they get out of the youth court. But we need to expand that. If we don't expand it, of course, the numbers continue to, to increase. So the next level promises to be exciting. It promises to be as challenging as uh, possibly where we're coming from. But as the president has said repeatedly, we have no other focus, we have no other commitment but the progress of this country. And we will ensure that step by step we get to where it is that we promise the country that we're taking the country to. So I want to say to you all that the next level is for all of us. And I urge that all of us cooperate to take us to this next level. So on behalf of the President, Mohammed Buhari, who I represent here today, again, I'd like to wish Ashwa Jibola Ahmed Tinubu a happy birthday and say thank you all very much for making the time to come to this event. God bless you all.